I'd like to welcome everyone back. It's been some time since I've been on Real Vision, uh, but there's absolutely no resisting uh, coming back to visit with Lacey Hunt. Uh, I, I will tell you that the last time he and I sat down was in Austin, Texas at the top of a wonderful uh, building on a beautiful uh, afternoon like it is here in Dallas today. But the one differentiating factor was there was, we'd never heard of COVID. Uh, and so it was a different world back then. Uh, but again, I'm so, so, so pleased and honored and privileged and you name it uh, to have Lacey Hunt back to visit with. Uh, this is, I've, I've literally been counting the days. The first time we had this scheduled, we were engulfed in ice Mageddon, uh, but I'm happy that we could make this happen. Lacey, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for your kind remarks. My pleasure. So uh, for, for those of you who are less uh, less familiar with, with Lacey and myself, we have a shared history, albeit separated by several decades at the Dallas <laughs> Federal Reserve, <laughs> two years in between. <laughs> but nonetheless, I think we both understand and will probably never, uh, will we'll be indelibly marked by understanding how things work inside of the Federal Reserve system. Um, with that, I actually want to go back to a long time ago, to 1981, 40 years ago, and, and ask what it was like back then. You know, we saw in 1969, we, we saw the unemployment rate troughed at 3.5%. And it would be another 50 years before we revisited such low levels with the U3 unemployment rate. But in, in, in the 10 years or so that, 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 that went on from then, we saw a slow build in inflation. And I'm, I'm curious if you can take us back to what it was like to, to sense this burgeoning thrust of inflation as the years ticked by way back then, again, off of this very low level of slack in, in the economy as it was uh, back in, in 1969. My tax a little different <laughs> than a lot of folks, uh, as you know. Um, and um, I take a monetary view. I, I take the monetary view of Professor Friedman's algebra, uh, not Professor Friedman's famous dictum that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. In his algebra, he makes it very clear that that statement is based upon the assumption that the velocity of money is stable. And um, of course, people, all they remember is the quote. They don't remember the algebra. Most people don't even bother to study the algebra. But um, monetary policy was far different. Um, from the early 1950s to the early 1980s than it has been since then. And um, the critical factor is that the US economy was very lightly indebted, not heavily indebted as we are today. And um, one sign of this was that the marginal revenue product of debt, while not constant, was also relatively stable. It was basically in a very tight range of between 70 and 80 cents. In other words, every dollar of new debt. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I wanna tell you something important, is I can tell that you really wanna learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. A constant was also relatively stable. It was basically in a very tight range of between 70 and 80 cents. In other words, every dollar of new debt generated about 75 cents of GDP growth. And during that time period, 
the velocity of money was also stable. And so the confluence of factors that made the 1970s and early 1980s so inflationary was that the money supply increases moved directly into the real economy. For example, if memory serves me correctly, in, in the 1970s, M2 cre increased about 10% per annum. Velocity was stable. I don't mean to say it was constant, but it, it, when there were increases, there were decreases, and it was basically hanging around the same level. And nominal GDP increased by 10%. And so the, the Federal Reserve allowed money supply growth to accelerate. Velocity did not detract. And it, and it showed up in rising inflation. Uh, as we have moved away from the 1980s, the US economy has been increasingly indebted. And um, today, the marginal revenue product of debt is less than 40 cents. In other words, each dollar of new debt only generates 40 cents of GDP growth. And what is happening is that the velocity of money is declining. And so when you have a year like um, 2020, where M2 increases at a 20% annual rate or 25, whatever the number was, um, the inclination of many people who remember Professor Friedman's words think we should have inflation but they don't remember his algebra. And so when you have a large increase in the money supply and the velocity of money collapses to new all-time lows, then the money supply is basically trapped in the financial markets. It doesn't make its way into the real economy. And, and by the way, um, the monetary framework that that Friedman used, the equation of exchange, which says money times velocity equals GDP, was actually developed by Irving Fisher. And Fisher uh, was cited by Friedman as being America's greatest economist. Uh, Fisher never believed the velocity of money was stable. In other words, he and Friedman parted company. And um, Fisher actually said in a very famous 1934 article that when economies become extremely over indebted, the velocity of money falls. And so what's happening is that we're, we're taking on more and more debt that is not going to generate an income stream to repay principal and interest. And this pushes the velocity of money lower. And so although it's quite possible that economic growth this year will be as fast as it was in 1983. We're not gonna have inflation. We're facing cyclical deflation. And um, so it's a major, uh, a major difference with the 1970s between then and now. So where, where are we in, in the economic cycle that we're in Right now, you, you hear so much, and I, I think about you every time I hear them, that that stimulus spending in and of itself, obviously not taking into the into account the difference between 75 cents on the dollar and 40 cents today. But we hear that the stimulus spending is going to is going to miraculously and expeditiously close the output gap. It's going to generate permanent job creation. It's going to take the unemployment rate very rapidly back down to what the Federal Reserve terms as full employment. What, what are the masses missing in, in, in crafting this, this, this very simplistic construct? Well, if that if first was, <laughs> there's a lot of problems with it. Let me just, let's do the, we can, there, we can analyze it empirically then we'll analyze it theoretically. Um, we've seen 30 or so uh, different um, major debt finance programs in Japan since the late 1980s. 
And um, they were generally hailed as being a solution for Japan's uh, desperate circumstances. Um, yet, um, uh, in Japan, uh, each dollar of debt's only generating 25 cents on the dollar. And the velocity of money in Japan is 0.5, 70 points lower than in the United States. And it hadn't worked there. Europe has about two, two dozen programs uh, that have been used to try to solve an indebtedness problem by taking on more debt. And it, it's not worked for them. And um, I think there's a lot of other corroborating information to support this empirical data. Um, if, if uh, when I was in graduate school, um, back in the 1960s, I left to go into the Fed in 1969, William McChesney Martin was chairman. You know that name, Daniel. Oh, he's my favorite. Yes, indeed. And uh, when I left the Fed, Arthur Burns was chairman. Hmm. Uh, a long, long time ago. But when, when I left the Federal Reserve, I mean, left Temple University to go to the Dallas Fed. Um, there were two main propositions that were generally widely accepted about monetary and fiscal policy. Number one, that the velocity of money was relatively stable, um, which made monetary policy very powerful. Because if you get an 10% increase in money, you get a 10% increase in knowledge. And the second proposition was that fiscal policy was also very powerful. And um, I was sort of of the notion, uh, having been taught at three different universities, the same basic concept, that for each dollar of debt finance federal activity, this would boost uh, the GDP by four to five dollars three years later. In other words, that there was a very powerful government multiplier. Um, today, I would say the government expenditure multiplier after three years is negative 0.2. In other words, if you engage in a dollar of debt finance fiscal activity, um, that will boost the GDP by a dollar. But at the end of three years, you will reduce private GDP by about a dollar and twenty cents. In other words, there is there is no magic Keynesian multiplier, um, and uh, we've really seen this happen. Um, just uh, there's, I'm going to just cite some earlier programs in the U.S. Um, we had the shovel ready projects of 2009 bolstered by a, a, a massive uh, expansion of the Fed's balance sheet. And folks said that this was a surefire growth uh, engine and that it would not only lead to faster growth, but a quick turnaround in inflation and interest rates. But when you look, when you look at the debt finance shovel ready projects of 2009, we had about two strong quarters and that was it. And then the growth rate decelerated. And so initially, the commodity prices rose because inflation was going up, growth was going to be strong. The dollar went down, bond yields went up. But within very short order, once it became clear that that fiscal package was not going to change the dynamic, we, we slumped back and interest rates continued declining and so did inflation for a long time. And then um, if you go to um, 2017, you have a different administration, different party in power, and, and they pass debt financed uh, tax reductions. Uh, it was about, uh, pumped about $300 billion a year for 10 years. Uh, and, they, and they said the tax rates would be low for 10 years. And people had some concept of permanent income, which is an important concept in economics. And what we and and the tax cuts were also bolstered by a huge bipartisan increase in the budget deficit 
in both uh, 2019 and 2020. Um, and yet, what was the result? After the Trump tax cuts took effect, we had one strong, one good quarter of growth. We had a second quarter, it wasn't quite as good, but it was better than we generally get. And then the growth rate came off. And that, that pattern is gonna be replayed in time and time again, as long as you uh, reorder it. It, it. We have a larger size program than we've ever had before, but it's still debt financed. And debt financed is not the solution, it's more of a problem other than for a very transitory bout. And so the pattern of disinflation that we've seen is going to persist. It's not going to be interrupted. Now, I might make one other point. Uh, one does have to take account of the business cycle. And one also has to take account for other initial conditions because they also matter. I mean, monetary and fiscal policy are not operating in a, in a vacuum. And uh, so we, we, we have a large debt finance program. We're coming off a very, very deep recession, both domestically and globally. Um, and uh, one of the things that I think is vastly overlooked is that inflation and long bond yields, high, high risk-free bond yields, are what we in economics call lagging economic indicators. Um, the, the pioneering work on the business cycle was done um, by Wesley Clare Mitchell and his student, Arthur Burns, who was chairman of the Federal Reserve when I left the Fed. And they show that interest rates are a lagging economic indicator. So is inflation. GDP, of course, is the main coincident indicator. Mm -hmm. So when a recovery starts, inflation and interest rates still go lower. And the rationale of their arguments is that's the way it has to be. In other words, if you try to start a recovery and, and get an immediate rebound in inflation and interest rates, then you start building in imbalances and you immediately truncate the recovery. Um, so for example, um, in 1983, um, which some people say the growth rate this year will be as good as 1983, possibly as good as 1959, coming off a deep recession, early 1980s, where coil to go up. In 83, you have the debt financed Reagan tax cuts. However, in 1983, gross government debt is 30% of GDP, not 126 where we are today on the way to 140 in a matter of less than 10 years. And uh, so in 1983, we, we had you know nearly 9% GDP growth, but there was a cyclical rebound in productivity. That's what happens after a deep recession. And as a matter of fact, the inflation rate fell and it continued moving lower all the way through the end of 1986. Inflation's a lagging economic indicator. Interest rates also declined until 1987. But uh, so, the, the, when you look at the cyclical analysis, you have to take account of, of the different role of the business cycle. Now, I would contend to you that there is another different cyclical element that points in the direction of lower inflation. Uh, last year, when COVID hit, um, the major supply chains were massively disrupted. And what this meant is that the, the low cost producers in Asia and elsewhere could not deliver their products into the US market. And so as a consequence of, of COVID, the um, US high cost producers actually received an event that was more favorable to them 
than far more favorable than the Trump tariff increases. It was purely extraneous event. So, so the net result is, is that the high cost domestic producers were able to gain market share and the low cost foreign producers lost market share. Well, now the number of sick people is declining, hospitalizations going down, we're vaccinating people, and the supply chains are going to be restored. They're not fully restored, but they're moving in that direction. And so what, what, what the situation is, is that the low, the low cost producers in Asia have lost market share and the high cost producers in the US have gained market share. And both of them are gonna to try to hold. So what we're gonna see as the supply chains are restored is a price war. Everybody's gonna to try to get back to where they were, except the US producers are gonna to try to hold. And there's another element that's different. Crises change the underlying economic circumstances. Uh, the old phrase, necessity is the mother of invention. Of course. And, and so when COVID hit, uh, it's like during a wartime, the um, technologies of the future were telescoped into 2020. And so the underlying technology today is substantially different than it was a year ago. And, and that suggests that the gains in productivity are going to be good. And they're not going to be bad. And um, so we're, we're set up to, to see renewed competition. And, and uh, there's already some evidence of this in spite of the psych uh, inflationary psychosis that's been uh, gripping the financial markets. Um, if you go back and look at the core inflation rates in the, in the third quarter, they were actually at a 4% annual rate. In the last three months, they're under a 1% annual rate. In other words, the third quarter was the, was the peak for the supply side disruptions. And very quietly, the core inflation rates have been working their way downward. Now, we have a situation where the core inflation rate last three months in the United States is, is hanging right below 1%, but the core inflation rates in China are closer to zero. So what, what's going to happen here in this price war is that the core inflation rates are going to be pulled between the low cost rates in China and the higher cost rates here. That, that, that to me is not an inflationary situation. It's a disinflationary situation. So before we get to the psychosis that's gripping the markets, and it feels like a psychosis, um, talk to me about, about permanent unemployment. Right now, the percentage of the pool of unemployed Americans uh, as of the latest data points, 4 to 1.5%. Uh, we're at levels that have never been seen outside of the years that followed the financial crisis. So you can go back to the double dip recession of the 1980s. You still don't get as high of a percentage of permanent unemployment. And that does not obviously incorporate the five plus million who've dropped out of the labor force since then. To me at least, and it's something that not many people talk about, but to me at least it seems like there's been some permanent damage uh, done to the labor force that that Yellen and Powell have a hard time convincing me is going to be rectified quickly. Well, um, you're absolutely right, Daniel. And I like the way you stated it. Um, I think the only thing that I can add is to kind of look at, at the broad sweep of history. And um, from uh, the 1870s, where we, where we have uh, good numbers on the national accounts, until the economy became heavily indebted uh, in the late 1990s, uh, in real per capita terms, um, the GDP growth rate was 2.2% per annum. And 
Um, since then, the real per capita GDP growth has only been 1.2% per annum. Now, you need a rising, uh, uh, a rising uh, real per capita growth rate to, to boost the standard of living. And when you do not do that, you, you then cause a lot of, uh, of tertiary damage, secondary and tertiary damage that reinforces the over indebtedness and um, makes it increasingly difficult for the economy to, to achieve a generic self-sustaining growth. Um, and what I'm talking about here is, is to look at the production function. The uh, production function says that, that economic output is determined by technology interacting with the factors of production, land, labor, uh, and that, and, and demographics. Um, as a result of, of the deteriorating increase in our standard of living, we have uh, caused, not just in the United States, but globally, a major deterioration in the demographics during this period of high indebtedness. Um, if you go back to the early 1900s where we have comparable data, population growth was 1.2% per annum. When uh, we, in the late 90s, when we, we started moving into this high indebtedness, we were growing 1.3% per annum. Now we're just growing 0.35. Um, what economies need is they need population growth, they, they need family formation, they need babies, and they need to stay young. Well, our birth rate's at an all-time low, the family formation rate is extremely depressed, and the average age of the U.S. population is creeping upward. Moreover, the demographics are deteriorating worse in all of our major uh, trading partners. Uh, mm -hmm. Last year, for example, um, population growth in, in Europe was only 0.25. The average age of, of, of Europe is substantially greater than the US. Um, last year, the population declined 0.3% per annum in Japan. When, when Japan, uh, went into its debt bubble there in the late 1980s, it was still growing almost 1% per annum. In other words, we, we, we've, we've seen as, as the Japanese have misplayed the debt card and it's pulled the growth rate down, it's, it's reinforced negative demographics. And although the, the official numbers from China say that they have population growth, um, the private demographers say that it, it, they do not. And it's hard to believe that a country that had one child for family for so many years and allowed a major mismatch between young men and young women, uh, how they could possibly reverse that uh, is, is beyond me. The, the Japanese demographics are, are greater. The average age in China is already uh, 40 years versus 38 something in the US. And every 12 months that goes by, the average age in China is getting six months older. So when you, when you pursue failed policies and they exist long, en long enough to cause a deterioration in demographics, then you uh, add another element to this disinflationary stew. And um, I, I, suspe I suspect that we've changed attitudes in a lot of ways. You know, um, there were a lot of cute articles um, that came out when the pandemic hit. And people said, well, we're close proximity, the birth rate's going up. <laughs> yes. US, everywhere, the birth rate's going up. Good news. Baby boom. Okay, so, well, the, the results are still prim, uh, uh, preliminary, and of course you gotta allow for the, the waiting time, you know, uh, the nine month period. The gestation so period, Lacey, yes. But, but we have some of the states in, including California and 
and Florida, and we have 50,000 fewer births than we did a year ago. And the numbers have been coming in in various European countries, and um, we have some tentative indications in, in China. Uh, everywhere the birth rate went down. And, and this is a perfect illustration. What was more important, close proximity or deteriorating economics. Now, the pandemic was a non-economic factor, but it served to reinforce uh, one of the biggest challenges that the U.S. has and the rest of the world has. And, and so um, to, to blindly focus on the size of these fiscal packages and, and assume that there's some sort of panacea. Uh, that's not my view of economics. And I, I, I think that they will be just as wrong as they were with regard to the power of the tax cuts of the prior administration and of the uh, shovel ready projects of an even earlier administration. So Lacey, something I've been harping on for years and a lot of the work that I did when I was inside the Federal Reserve was kind of the long-term effects of of this disinflationary stew, as you just said, of this two entire cycles, one driven by real estate, the next driven by financial engineering, and what effect this would have long term on on homeowner, excuse me, on homeownership rates, on headship rates, on household formation, and you know something we've seen coming out of COVID is this this rush to have multiple generations living under one roof. So rather than the baby boomers emptying out their homes and, 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 and going smaller. Instead, they've got their children moving in with them so that they can procreate at some point and have the money to do so because the income generating capacity for millennials is not what it was for their parents' generation. So uh, to me, at least, it seems- uh, yeah, But that's been going that on for some time. That's it, been going on for some time. It, it and it's still, going on it's for still some not time. giving the youngsters enough of a cushion to reverse the deteriorating. It's not, rate. but but it, but if anything, to your point, we've seen automation accelerate it by several years. And if, if you're Joe Q, CEO, CFO, and you were on the fence about automating, you're not on the fence anymore. Uh, and if there was this trend told, towards multiple generations, and you've refinanced at a two and three quarters percent mortgage rate, I, I mean, what what's the outlook for mobility in mm -hmm. this country? Well, it, it's it's. It, it, it's, um, let, let's look at it this way. Um, if you take the production function, which says that per capita GDP is equal to uh, technology interacting with land, labor, and capital. So we know the marginal revenue product of debt in the United States, which is about 35 cents. Um, and uh, our demographics last year were 0.35. Um, so that adds to 0.7. So let's assume that natural resource contribution is flat, has been for a long time. And let's assume that Dr. Gordon at Northwestern is correct, that the technology is more evolutionary than revolutionary. It's not what we're seeing today uh, doesn't enhance the demand for labor and natural resources, not like the internal combustion engine or modern communication, sanitation, things where you, the technology requires everything else to work with it. And so we were at 2.2% per capita GDP growth until we became heavily indebted. Then we dropped down to 1.2. And using the production function, which is sort of a long run view of looking at the world, it, it doesn't mean it's gonna hold quarter to quarter or year to year. It's telling us we're dropping below one. We do not have the physical inputs um, to, uh, to break this mold. And, and, and there's another argument here that I, I think is very, very consistent with it. Um, uh, I'm sure you know the name Michael Spence, Nobel laureate 2001, uh, Dean Stanford School of Business, highly regarded. Uh, he's done some very interesting work with um, former Fed board member Kevin Walsh. And um, the, the thrust of their argument, to my way of thinking, is very compatible with what we're seeing when money supply goes up, but velocity goes down 
and the funds don't make it into the real economy. What, what Spence and Wash are saying is that inadvertently, when the Federal Reserve um, engages in quantitative easing uh, and this long forward guidance, and whenever the stock market is in trouble, they come in and provide liquidity and price support through some type of uh, operation. What the Fed is basically doing is they are signaling to the corporate managers that financial assets, the price is protected and the liquidity is protected. And so this causes the corporate managers to put more and more of their resources in financial investment mm -hmm. and less investment in the real. But now financial investment is, is good for those assets, but to get economic growth, you need real investments. And, and so the net result is that the, the Federal Reserve in its, in its um, desire to support the financial markets, they're actually causing increasingly inferior results. And, and there are a couple of very good uh, economic relationships that are obliterated by what the Fed does. One is called moral hazard, and the other is creative destruction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Free, uh, free market economies need uh, to uh, allow risk-taking to be rewarded when it's appropriate, but to be punished when it's inappropriate. And, and also, uh, you, you need what Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction. You need the markets to allocate capital to those areas that will achieve growth. But when you come in and you, you, you pump up all assets, as the Fed did last April, they obliterate moral hazard and creative destruction. And so the net result is that the Federal Reserve is an unwitting accomplice of all of these patterns that are contributing to the deteriorating economic growth rate over time. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. I just read that that corporate America is now sitting on $2.2 trillion of cash and they're revving up their share buyback machine all over again after having wow. survived this crisis that has resulted in negligible, if any, uh, investment outside of, again, doing as much automation as they can um, so but let's stay on the financial markets for just a second. Some would argue that, especially given retail participation being over 20% of, of the market and some of the, some of the zanier things that we're seeing happen with SPACs and, and, and chat boards and the, the things that you wake up and you say, surely that's not a real headline. Um, does it matter where valuations are at any given point in time for how efficacious Fed policy is, or is it just a matter of they've got enough tools in the toolbox to continue incentivizing corporate management to do as they've done now for, well, since, since the financial crisis? Well, this is the way I look at it. Um, two decades ago and prior to that, the stock market was considered a leading economic indicator. I don't think it is anymore. I think basically it's become a tool of monetary policy and they place considerable focus on it and the stock market no longer plays that role. Um, and as, as someone whose entire focus is on the fixed income markets, I would have to say that it's been, I've, I, what I've had to do is I've had to look at the real economic indicators to pick up the trends in growth and inflation and ignore what was going on in the stock market. Uh, if you go back in time, corporate profits were also a leading economic indicator. And I believe they still are. And to me, corporate profits are very, very telling indicators. And, and to my measure of thinking is, is the statistic that comes out of the national accounts. And the numbers are very, very revealed, Danielle, very, very revealing. If, if you look at the, um, the after-tax profits adjusted for inflation, um, 
last year, we don't have the final numbers for the fourth quarter yet. Um, profits in 2020 are unchanged from nine years ago. Um, which to my way of thinking is very consistent with what we've seen in the deceleration in real per capita GDP growth. And also the fact that net national saving keeps coming down. Net national saving has three components, private, government, and net foreign. And generally speaking, the government deficits have been so increasingly large, they've absorbed all of this saving. Last year, I think, um, net national saving, government, private, and foreign, was uh, probably just barely positive. Historically, it's been 6.5% since 1929. And, and the only time that it's lower is 2009, and then the readings in the Great Depression. Um, we, we, we don't generate saving out of income. You're not going to get investment out of income. And, and so that is basically uh, compatible with the story that the financial manager, the corporate managers are told to invest in financial assets and ignore the real assets. It, it, it makes a huge difference. And uh, the, the fact of the matter is uh, the US economy was not performing well before uh, the pandemic hit. Um, the pandemic will end, but the structural problems of extreme over indebtedness Deteriorating, uh, deteriorating demographics, misallocation away from the real sector to the financial sector, uh, those problems are actually all intensified. And, and I'm, I'm afraid that the, those who, who expect miracles from the, the huge fiscal uh, programs is going to be very disappointed after a very short period of time. So I, I will never forget uh, the last time we met uh, you had taken you taken me back in time to every time in modern world history that global trade had contracted on an annual basis, and every time in 2020 I heard the recession referred to as the COVID recession. You popped into my mind, and I said, "Well, wait a minute. Global trade was negative for the entire year in 2019. That's we might correct. not have been well, heading in that direction seismically." but we were heading in that direction because global trade contracted. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people have a good understanding for how sclerotic the growth was prior to the pandemic hitting. No, I think, I think that the initial conditions were bad when the pandemic hit and they're worse today. Um, so why- If that makes me a grump, well then make me a grump. <laughs> I mean, no, nothing has you know, nothing has really changed in terms of corporate balance sheets. They've just become more indebted than they were before. So, uh, you're you're right. Not very much has changed. Um, but the well, mind. There, yeah, no, no, because because we're more leveraged now. Well, right. Uh, yeah, it's worse. Let me let me just let me just give you a couple of numbers. I mean, if you if you look at total debt, which is what you have to do to go back over the last hundred and fifty years. Um, we, we had four major debt binges uh, that culminated in 1873, 1929, 2008, 2009, and today. Now, those earlier debt binges, we basically reversed them. We, with great difficulty, paid off uh, the railroad debt and the industries that fed the railroad from the uh, hectic period of the 1860s and 70s. And we had a fairly long sustained period until we started uh, down the debt road in the 1920s. Um, and, but we, and then the 1930s were difficult, but we managed to pay the debt down as a consequence of World War II. And we had a, another prolonged period until we got into the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and the debt started taking off. Uh, now we have set a new peak of debt to GDP within 12 years of the last peak. Now, what we know about looking at those earlier historic cases, in all of them, there was significant disinflation. The higher indebtedness led to falling rates of inflation. And in two of the cases, there was such fall inflation that we actually went into deflation. 
So the, so the U.S. economy is more indebted. Um, if you think about the great work um, done on the, on the role of government debt by uh, uh, in the American Economic Review article of 2012 done by uh, the two Reinhardts and Ken Rogoff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and they show that there is a, that when gov- gross government debt rises above 90% of GDP for more than five years, you lose a third of your economic growth rate. And, uh, and in fact, we've come down from 2.2 to 1.2. We're losing more, but it's right in line with what they said. But there's corroboration by other uh, serious economists in the United States, Stephen Cicchetti, Alan Taylor. There's the great work of uh, Dr. Philip Rother in Europe at the ECB and uh, Christina Cecherita. And what they show is that, is that when, when government debt starts approaching 40 to 50%, you get this detraction from economic activity, 50 it intensifies, and as you go up, it gets more and more significant. And so uh, you, you, you have now debt levels that are way outside any historical pattern. But we know that when we've taken this road, it leads to deteriorating growth, this inflation, and, um, it reinforces negative trends in demographics. And that's going to be a hard pattern to break, in my view. Take us to where we are, because I cannot tell you how many people, and and the evidence is, I I visited for a long time recently with uh, Richard Werner, who spent many of his years in Japan uh, in in the aftermath of the 1990s. And and we've definitely created debt specifically for the purpose of consumption, which should be inflationary in the short term, and from what we've heard from airlines and hotels and resorts and what have you, we are going to see a pickup in services inflation. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by the tug of war, the competition between between domestic suppliers and overseas suppliers who want to retain their pre-COVID market share. So it seems like that input price peak may be behind us. But right now, it's still very much front and center, in addition to very high shipping and freight rates, and then you have these base effects. But you have Powell and Yellen both standing firm saying, this is going to be transitory. There's nothing to see here. So if there's one thing that we've seen, it's that that we have seen a sustained rise for seven to eight weeks off a very low base, 0.4% on the tenure, more than tripled in very short order. So there is some uh, there is some sign of stress in the markets as okay. a result. Uh, let me let me tell you where I think the stress is coming from. Okay. Primarily. Um, and I actually draw a parallel between when the Fed announced their new policy framework last uh, fall and something that happened in 2009. And I'm, I'm sure you'll remember it. Um, when um, the Bernanke Fed uh, engaged in what was than asset the sheet expansion or quantitative easing. Uh, former Chairman Bernanke appeared on 60 Minutes with Scott Pelley. And Scott Pelley asked uh, Chairman Bernanke, what exactly is this quantitative easing? And Bernanke said, well, it, we're basically printing money, which of course immediately conjured up the notion of higher inflation. Now, of course, the Fed doesn't print money. They, the Fed's liabilities are not medium of exchange. They're not a store of value. They're not money. They do not circulate. L- They're L- people L- that L- want to make it. You, you should stop and repeat those three things one <laughs> more time, Lacey. Money has to be a medium of exchange, store of value, unit of account. The Fed's liabilities do not circulate. They can have a first round increase, uh, impact on money supply, but you, you have to have coordinate with velocity. The, the, the Federal Reserve Act was set up to make the Fed lender of last resort, not to make the Fed spender of last resort. The, the Senator Carter Glass uh, went to Fisher at Yale and Whittlesey at Penn and said, how do we give the Fed great lending power, but we don't want to make them uh, a banana republic. I mean, there are people that want to go that route, Danielle. And you know, but so far that that's not consistent with the Federal Reserve Act. 
And, but, but anyway, so Bernanke appears. He says, well, the Fed's printing money, which, of course, they weren't. He should have never said that. It was a loose statement. He does, to his credit, 18 months later, appear again and said, well, he misspoke. Well, OK, you know, in the heat of a television interview, you misspoke. But this is the world leading monetary expert saying the Fed's printing money. OK, so he, he with, with in com combination with the shovel ready projects, there was a big surge in inflationary psychosis, just like we had now. And it gripped the markets big time, major backup in, in yields in, in 2009, just, just as we've seen in the last 14 months or so. OK, the Federal Reserve unveils a new monetary framework. And they say they're no longer targeting a 2% inflation, but they're going to allow it to go above. We want higher inflation. Well, OK. For most folks, they've, they've more or less got to follow a central bank. I, I don't think that that's a good investment strategy. I, I personally think that the, the Fed has to be faded. I mean, um, I, they, they're a big organization. They're the most expensive research organization in the world. <laughs> but but the fact of the matter is only 784 PhDs, Lacey, targets. just 784. They've never hit their inflation targets since they've been making them for now more than 10 years. They got the GDP forecast one year, missed, it. and in every case, they overpredicted inflation and they overpredicted real growth. But nevertheless, the Fed is saying we're willing to tolerate higher inflation. Now, uh, think about that in context with what I just talked to you about earlier. When when economy comes out of a recession, we need interest rates and inflation to fall. They're lagging indicators. You, you don't want inflation to go up at the start of an economic expansion. And so here the Federal Reserve is trying to support higher inflation and con uh, contravene the business cycle. And, and so to my way of thinking, the Fed's policy action of trying to move everybody into an inflationary mindset is exactly the same thing that Bernanke did in 2009. And I don't believe that, that the new approach of the Powell Fed will be any more successful than the old approach under Bernanke. Well, and, and this time they're 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 trying even harder. But now now they own a fifth of the tips market, so they're actually trying to buy and pay for the narrative uh, and 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 physically push up inflation expectations, so that the market sees them and follows them into the tips market. It, it's it's really extraordinary. You, you, I, I might teach you one thing for a change, and this will be a first and a last, I promise. But <laughs> but when they announced average inflation targeting as the new formal regime at Jackson Hole. The, the benchmark 10-year yield moved by 10 basis points. That's it. That's all they got for this yeah. average regime. And, and it, bear in mind, since Bernanke announced this, they've hit 2% on the core 12 times since, since they announced quantitative easing. It's the most ridiculous exercise, and I don't know what. So, but the bottom line is- uh, It's clear the Fed- the Fed. The Fed doesn't think very highly of folks that think like you and I do. Well, no, they don't. But 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 Powell is going to be <sighs> proven right about the transitory, transient nature of inflation. And yet, you know, we've seen foreign purchases of treasuries drop from about 33 percent of, of, of what's in the public tangent, about 25 percent. Uh, you know, from from what my Beltway contacts tell me, this next three to four trillion dollars can be accomplished via reconciliation. So no no more than 50 votes needed again. And it seems like the Fed will be there to print the money. So um, what will be accomplished if, and I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna spell out some very quick math. I walked through this new stimulus package, a, 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 a single working mother of two children uh, who was unemployed and collecting the benefits and the, the beneficiary of the rental eviction moratorium and the Obamacare premium being covered, the utility bill uh, being covered, the 500 or so dollars per month deposited into the account uh, 
uh, in the form of child uh, child care tax credit. I added up all of the the inputs to an annualized salary, if you will, with not a penny of stimulus check money. This is just a pure what she's getting by decree of the new legislation and it added up to $60,912, mm -hmm. give or take. So, uh, so th this is my big burning question. They're going to print more money yet. And I, I'm an acolyte of yours. I believe that it's not going to work as it's designed to work given, I don't know how many you said Japan had had, 40 mm -hmm. since, since 89. Um, Janet Yellen is a UC Berkeley educated labor economist. She's going to grow frustrated with policies that, that inadvertently appeal to people not coming back into the workforce. And she is no longer in a position of being a central banker. She is the treasury secretary. And there is, in my mind at least, a pathway that you could see her level of frustration grow to be very high. And, and I think that this is where your, your mindset finally departs from, from pushing on a string to crossing a line. And I think you know where I'm going with this. About a month before the election in 2016, uh, Janet Yellen gave a speech. It was around, it was in mid-October. And she said questions about how the U.S. economy functions. And a couple of the questions that she said that needed to be answered by economists was what determines inflation? And in other words, she made it very clear that she didn't really know the answer. And then she also said, uh, how does the monetary sector of the economy interact with the real sector? And she basically chiding the, um, the economics profession to, to work on these two important issues. Well, today she tells us that she does know how inflation works. And uh, that's a big switch. But uh, I don't think the foundation has been properly laid. And I also don't think the foundation has been addressed as to how the financial sector interacts with the real sector. And the relationships are, are there, but they're not there in the way that they are viewed conventionally in most of the uh, macro theory books. Trickle down. Or even the advanced research in macroeconomics. They're, and there is a strong view that is held by a number of people that when you become extremely over indebted, uh, basically monetary policy's capabilities are asymmetric. In other words, if you want to use uh, a tighter monetary regime, that will slow the economy. But stimulative measures are largely impotent, not entirely, but they are increasingly frail. And um, the same is basically true with regard to fiscal policy, that, that these engines uh, that were so powerful uh, five decades ago are no longer really much in the way of a viable option. And in fact, I think what we're learning is that when we, we combine monetary and fiscal policy to make the economies more indebted, we're going down a counterproductive path. So let's, let, let's just take this one last step and let's say that Janet Yellen finally understands empirically that the transmission mechanism between monetary policy and the real economy is broken and that it stops somewhere in between in the financial markets and gets stuck there. So if you want to provide money directly to the people, if you want for, for individuals to have accounts at the Federal Reserve, uh, if you want to start looking into the future, and as they alluded to um, in international meetings recently, be prepared for China to roll out its own digital currency. Uh, the she would finally find the mechanism, Lacey, I think. I think that she- Well, there are people, the people, people out there that wanna 
uh, cr create a digital account for all non-institutional uh, all non-institutionalized adults so that it can be funded with the Fed's liabilities. Um, in my view, that is uh, a whole different regime. In that case, you would be printing money. And if we go down that route, in very short order, we will get half our inflation. We'll, you will trigger what's called Gresham's Law. The bad money will chase out the good money. And, and so one of the risks to the evolution of monetary policy and fiscal policy is that it becomes apparent that even astronomically large increases in debt really do not produce a sanguine result that we, we go to money printing. And um, fortunately, uh, we are a nation of laws. And um, in my view, this would have to be uh, a result of a law change. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think the current Fed chairman would advocate that. In other words, he, he said repeatedly, the Fed has lending powers, but it doesn't have spending powers. And moreover, uh, the, the, to, to change the Federal Reserve Act, you're going to have to have the Federal Reserve guide the Congress through it. And, and so you... If you open up the Federal Reserve Act for revision, then all the other proposals that are out there are going to be swept swept into it. We won't, we won't just be whatever the Fed says. We'll 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 take up, and some of them are, as you know, pretty pretty extreme. And and so um, Powell has his job until uh, the end of January of 2022, and um, uh, he may or may not be reappointed. Uh, but he, someone would, would have to be reappointed that would want to make the Fed's liabilities medium of exchange. And if that were to happen, then we would know we would be on the road to hyperinflation. So um, to sort of paraphrase T.S. Eliot, this is what I would say. Uh, Eliot said that the world ends with a, with a, not with a bang, but with a whimper. It ends with a whimper if the solution is more and more debt. It ends with a bang if you convert and start going to more and more money printing. Lacey, I can't think of a better note to end on. Um, that was poetic. And <laughs> I'm right there with you in applauding the fact that we are a nation of laws. And let's not, let's not open Pandora's box. Let's leave the 1930 close safe. Uh, and you know, hopefully, a year from now, we're still talking about a world of Jay Powell. As, as much as I'm surprised to hear myself say that, because he will draw the line, I think, at digital currencies to the extent he can, and he does not advocate for negative interest rates. So, th th those are those are two lines we can hope continue. But let's let's do this again. I like ending on a cheery note, Daniel. Yes, I like T. S. Eliot. So that's a good. That. Thing. <laughs> Thanks so much for your time today. I really, really good it's fun being with you as place. always. Take care. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.